In Persona 4 Arena Ultimax, you can fight as a little league baseball coach named Junpei Iori that has a baseball gauge that's unique to him. If you hit an opponent or hit their projectile, you score a base. If you whiff, you get a strike. If you get hit, you get an out, and if they block your attack, you get a ball. When you get 10 runs, you automatically activate Victory Cry, which makes you more powerful, and every 10 runs after that increases your strength further. I could go on, but you probably already have more questions than answers, one of which might be, why do I gotta learn that? It's mechanics like this that give anime fighting games the reputation of being creative, but complex, in a genre that's already notorious for its complexity. At this point, you might be tempted to point out that complexity does not equal death, and maybe mention DIE KILLER! The most amazing fighting game experience on the planet! <laughs> Dive-kick defies conventions! Six buttons? No! Two buttons! One joystick? Try no joysticks! Dive-kick has an excellent complexity to depth ratio, probably the best in the business, and it's a game you can easily dive into and enjoy with almost anyone. The Dive-kick universe is basically a parody on fighting game culture, and at the risk of giving the devs too much credit, a masterful satire on the very idea of fighting game accessibility. I mean, they made a controller just for the game with hilariously large and colorful buttons as if to dare potential players to make the excuse that they suck at fighting games. While Dive Kick is fun and can even be competitive, it departs from the typical 2D fighter so much that it kind of creates its own subcategory. I mean, there's no walking in it. But what's so significant about this game is that it allows us to visualize a spectrum of potential fighters with many different levels of complexity. While this is a great avenue for innovation, there's always going to be that nagging feeling that we're just dumbing things down. This nagging feeling hit critical mass when it was rumored that Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite would be replacing Dragon Punch inputs with a much simpler down-down punch input. It turns out the original Dragon Punch input is still there, but the reaction to the rumor was telling. These kind of changes made to accommodate new players have left veterans rolling their eyes when they hear the word accessibility. So much so that accessibility is often followed by the assurance that depth will not be harmed in the making of the game. I don't doubt that this is possible, but just like how you'd want to know how your zero calorie soda preserves its flavor, I think it's worth looking at how accessible games try to preserve their death. Just for the taste of it. Now Diet Coke has NutraSweet. Diet Coke. The three categories of game accessibility are cognitive, motor, and sensory, and usually they refer to features that assist people with disabilities. For example, the blind Street Fighter player Sven has been using the two-channel stereo sound effects to know which side of the screen he's on to defeat his opponents. While sensory accessibility like this is mostly for people who have difficulty seeing or hearing, cognitive and motor accessibility are often for people without disabilities as well. One of the big cognitive accessibility goals in Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite was to reduce the amount of gameplay decisions you'd have to make at the character select screen. This is because the more decisions you make throughout the day, the worse your decisions will become, a phenomenon known as decision fatigue. Decision fatigue explains why judges are known to make less favorable decisions later in the day and why you buy that candy bar you didn't need at the end of your grocery shopping. Decision fatigue can eventually lead to decision avoidance, which in the gaming world means I ain't playing that. In Marvel vs. Capcom 3, you have to choose three characters and a type of assist for each one, making it a total of six decisions. For those who don't know, an assist is when you call out a teammate briefly to help you out in battle. In Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, they reduced teams to only two characters and removed the assist mechanic altogether. Now you only need to make three decisions, two for choosing your character and one for choosing an Infinity Stone, an item that gives your team special abilities. Aside from being a clever multi-channel marketing tool to tie the game into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Infinity Stones act as a way to maintain depth without having to learn a third character. Combine this with more flexible tag options and you have two characters with extra abilities as opposed to three characters with different assists. I don't know how much depth this will maintain, but it's clear they made a serious effort to try and preserve it after dropping two major aspects of the past two Marvel games. We have Marvel 2 and you call in, you know, your assist to cover yourself, and go back and forth and kind of have like this whole cover me aspect yeah right and even in marvel 3 is sort of the same right um a little bit more balanced but now marvel vs capcom infinite more freeform way more freeform as for motor accessibility the classic example is making special move execution easier to do this was actually a good thing when Street Fighter 2 made special move input windows more lenient from Street Fighter 1, which was just a nightmare to execute anything. But this wasn't enough, and by the time Street Fighter 4 came around, Dragon Punch inputs that were simply incorrect would work as long as the game thought you were close enough. 
This allowed comically sloppy inputs like this to work, and players actually created new strategies around them, like doing a dragon punch from crouching position. But why even keep motion inputs for special moves if so many people have trouble with them? After all, removing them would do so much for both motor and cognitive accessibility. The problem is, motion inputs are a part of what gives the game its depth. For example, the Shoryuken motion begins with the forward stick position, so it's easier to execute when walking forward and harder when walking backwards. Knowing this about your opponent is key to planning the best time to attack or defend. So what happens when you remove motion inputs from special moves and make them one button? Basically some moves get too powerful, and the developer has to find alternate ways to balance them. In the case of Rising Thunder, each special move had a cooldown time like you'd find in a MOBA, so you'd have to wait until you could use the special move again. While this removed a massive barrier to entry, you still had to understand concepts like high-low blocking, dashing, throw teching, damage scaling, stun, and an elaborate combo system. But what happens if you remove all that stuff too? Is the logical outcome something like dive kick? David Serlin, the creator of Fantasy Strike, doesn't think so. Well, I, I like to think of there's a spectrum where dive kick is on the far end over here. And when people play that and they say, this is really cool, what can I play next? The next thing I can play is a huge jump to all the other fighting games clustered on the other end. And there's really nothing here. And so we're trying to be in the middle between dive kick and, and everything else. While I describe dive kick as satirically accessible, Fantasy Strike is aggressively accessible while retaining enough elements of 2D fighters to stay in the broader genre. Basically, Fantasy Strike looks at Rising Thunder's accessibility and says, hold my beer. This game can literally be played with three buttons, one normal attack button and two special attack buttons. To do a super move, hit these two buttons at once. They also balance certain one-button specials in clever ways. For example, there's a character named Geiger who is basically a function of Street Fighter Skyle. Guile's special attack inputs famously disallow him to do the move right after walking forward, a crucial aspect of his archetype. To make sure Geiger can't use his sonic boom or flash kick functions while walking forward, he has a cooldown period every time you press forward, indicated by his gear icon. Attack variety is achieved by pressing a button while holding left or right, or while in the air, not too unlike Smash, but it's even simpler since up and down attacks don't exist in Fantasy Strike. Actually, you can play without any up or down inputs if you enable the jump button, which can be more intuitive for fans of platformers. And if you're wondering, there is no crouching in this game. That means two things. One, there's only a single type of blocking to worry about, which covers both high and low attacks. And two, it's now impossible to teabag. As for memorizing moves, most characters' entire move list can fit on one page, and life bars are comprised of units, not too unlike hearts in Zelda, which allow you to see exactly how much damage is done and exactly how much life a character has. But hands down, the greatest mechanic is the Yomi counter. Ejected. If someone is about to throw you, just do nothing and you'll perform a throw on them instead. This is so smart because when someone complains about your cheap throws, all you have to do is tell them to do nothing to counter it. If they still get thrown and complain, you can be like, oh, I guess doing nothing is too hard for you. You should totally email David Serlin about that. All sarcastic trash talk aside, this truly is the game of thought experiments, but it's real and it attains the goal of accessibility by quickly bringing a player from button mashing to playing almost entirely with purposeful decisions. This is also known as reaching intentionality, which I feel is required to fairly judge how good or bad a fighting game is. And this really hits the core of the fighting game problem. Even games like Guilty Gear Exert, with one of the best tutorials and in-game learning tools out there, still requires weeks, if not months, of practice to play with intentionality. This frustration makes it tempting for people who have not reached this level to hastily deem the game's advanced mechanics as unnecessary or otherwise illegitimate. Neuroscientist Sam Harris made an analogy to describe contemplative practices, which is incidentally instructive to this issue. Imagine where astronomy would be if everyone had to build his own telescope before he could even begin to see if astronomy was a legitimate enterprise. It wouldn't make the sky any less worthy of investigation, but it would make it immensely more difficult for us to establish astronomy as a science. Basically, Fantasy Strike only requires you to build the simplest telescope to see enough of the celestial brilliance of 2D fighting games to understand their appeal. And it might even inspire people to build more powerful telescopes to see the full spectrum of what the genre has to offer. Let me know in the comments what you think about these more accessible games. This was Gerald from Corey Gaming. Thanks for watching.